Hello and welcome to Esper Lux for our very first of our collector series videos. We're here in Zurich with Swiss Watch Gang at the Swiss Watch Gang Studios with Marco Concina. <laughs> exactly. Hey Marco. Hey Chris, what's up? What's going on? It's good to see you, man. Nice to see you, man, after a long time. Yeah. We, we saw each other so many times all the time, like SIH, Basel, you came to Switzerland, so now it's been a really long time. So it's, it's super cool to have you here, finally show you the offices. Good to travel again. It's yes. good to get to be able to get out and see people. Um, you know, it's it's been a it's been an interesting year and a half, I think. And finally, yeah. you know, I think things are starting to open up. So uh, it's a good opportunity to to come and visit you. This is where all the magic happens. Yes. Where this is uh, a studio, basically. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Very cool. And then uh, this is also where we shoot some of our stuff. Yeah. Uh, so and I interestingly enough. I was the first guest on your yes, yeah. interview well, series? When I started my YouTube, that was 2019. I came to Boston with the team in November, maybe, yeah. October. And you were the first collector on my channel, exactly. Okay. When was that? That was Link 2019? In description. 2019? <laughs> 2019. 2019. Yeah. All right. Uh, that was nice. Yeah. That Loved was it. That was a fun time. Uh, with, you, with your parents, like old pieces, vintage stuff. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah, a lot of cool stuff. Uh, so. Here today, we, we picked some few pieces yeah. uh, that have some meaning to you, uh, and perhaps some overlap in terms of uh, you know you were you were one of the first to place an emphasis on independence on your YouTube channel. Yeah, at this scale, probably. Yeah, at this, at this right, scale, yeah. exactly. And we're not going to look at just independence today yeah. from your collection, uh, but we are going to see some really interesting pieces um, and. Perhaps we could start with the very first watch that we have here. Sure, obviously. Yeah. This is the uh, Omega from the 70s. So this watch I bought back when I was in Slovenia still. So I asked my grandma to borrow me 200 euros because I was basically a student, had no money. I never worked because I was lazy when I was below 20 years old. Um, thanks, mom, for the support. And I got this watch and I picked it up. I, I drove like one hour away from my city to get it. When I came home, I put it on the wrist, you know, uh, I, I, and I played with the dog of my uncle and the watch dropped somehow. So I, lo I lost the crystal immediately. And when I saw this, uh, when I showed this watch to my grandma, she was a bit angry with me because she's like, I gave you 200 euros and you bought an old watch, which the glass just fell off. What's wrong with you? Um, but I really liked it. It has a nice movement, actually, Omega style, basically like copper colored. I don't know what the material is. Uh, Swan neck regulator, you know, really proper mechanical watch. Um, and I just really loved it. And this was the first one. So when I came to Switzerland in 2011, I got this uh, repaired and refurbished, a uh, new dial. I still have the old one here. I kept it. Um, and I paid 1,000 Swiss francs for the revision. But I didn't care because it's the first watch. This is never going to leave. I don't know what it's worth. I don't even care. The revision cost more than the watch. Yeah, five times more. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I made more money in Switzerland, so it was fine. I never wear this. It's really like a memento museum yeah. piece that I just try to keep because you know it's the first that started all of this. 1970s day date, Omega. Pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. It's a great you know, starting point. Yes. I mean, you know, when we talk when we talk to collectors, a lot of people tend to have. A Rolex or an Omega is their yeah. foundational collecting piece, right? Uh, sure. That they build on eventually and graduate to, you know, over time to to where they are today. Yeah. Um, I know mine was the first luxury watch I could afford to buy was an Omega Speedmaster, I so I can see. Yeah, definitely relate. <laughs> um, so super awesome. That so that was the first watch that you bought. Yes. Uh, we're gonna transition to something really interesting. Yeah which I'm familiar with because we did a little group buy together. <laughs> yes. So this is the Ming Copper, yeah. which came out, I think, three years ago. It was the end of 2019. Awesome, yeah. uh, we were we were all together here in Zurich, driving to Oslo and in, in Zurich, yeah, in, uh, <laughs> about 45 minutes outside of Zurich. If, for those yes. of you not familiar with Oslo, Oslo is an incredible atelier and workshop that does a lot of the R&D for her work, but also has their own proper um, a proper uh, brand, if you want to call it, where 
they make a watch uh, in traditional methods of watchmaking. Yeah. So they have all these and amazing- Entirely handmade. Huh? Entirely handmade, yeah, yeah w analog, right? And they have all these incredible uh, machines, you know, and, and that they've bought, you know, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, yeah. and they found, you know, most of them they found in the US. <laughs> so we were, we were on our way there with a couple of other uh, good friends. Yeah. And, and you told us about this. Yeah. And we just made a group buy four pieces. Yeah. Uh, it was awesome because this is, you know, always when we meet, we try to have this watch somehow. It's super difficult because we all travel with multiple watches all the time. But this is a memento piece as well. You know, it's for me, it's uh, more about the friendship we have as collectors, the community. It's not really the value of this watch is because this watch we bought for, for 1.2 thousand Swiss francs. Mm -hmm. Now it's 5.5 thousand. Yeah. So almost five X. It won the GPG award as well. So this That's is, right. I think the only Ming that won the GPG award, if not mistaken, super nice color. And again, for me, it just reminds it of the, the trip of us. Yeah, that so, was a fun trip. That was so a fun it's, trip. It's not like an investment piece or whatever at all. And we were lucky to get them actually. Yeah. It wasn't like, you know, Ming is very uh, sought after. Everything they post gets sold out in seconds nowadays. But back then it was slightly easier. I think we couldn't pull this off today. <laughs> very, very interesting dynamic. Ming, I think, is a, sort of a, a, a perfect example of these micro brands that have yeah. been able to truly capitalize on on a hot market, but also on you know social media and yeah, on definitely uh, value in terms of collecting. Yeah. I mean. For the price point, it's so hard yeah. to get something at this price point with you know, a nice design. That's right? this looking, this yeah. good looking. Um, you know, it's, this is, I believe, a Etta movement, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, and uh, they've they've worked with they've worked with some Etta movements. They've yeah. also worked with Schwartz Etienne movements. Yes. Terrific watch. It's one of my favorite watches too. It's just it's an interesting color. It's a good memory. Yeah. Again, not all these watches have to be because your investment or whatever. No, it's. For me, watch collecting is more about connecting the, the product with the emotional memory or whatever. So yeah. whether I visit you or something, I always try to have watches with me that, you know, mean something to us. We can't ignore the investment aspect that if you buy like a lot of watches. Um, but I think meaning should be the priority because it's luxury over at the end of the day. It's not essential products you need. S speaking of meaning, uh, I think this might be the most meaningful Watch, I think story wise, the yeah. Constantine Chaikin Joker. This is a, yeah, I love watchmaking and I always was a fan of the Academy. So as I started, let's say, going into watches, I always wanted to have a watch from the uh, independent watchmakers of the Academy, you know, Strehler, Halter, Urwerk, you know, those guys. And uh, Chaikin was also somebody I researched because I really love to explore new watchmakers, right? And after I saw this watch at the time, uh, one of my clients was a block to watch actually mm. uh, with an article on this and I had to post on social media. And yeah. I'm like, what the hell is this? Yeah. I posted it and the next day I went to see the watch in, in person and I loved it, you know? I think it's either a watch with a design that you love or hate one mistake with the design, it will be not successful as it is now, I think. The series was sold out immediately. So the only chance to get one was to get a piece unique. Um, but constantly said, you have to change something, you know? And I said, okay, let's change something on the back because I love the dial of the original one. That's it. So we engraved a um, Chinese line on the back as a symbol to basically protect me from bad spirits when I wear it. I love Asia, you, you know that. Yeah. Um, and it's a nice mix of, let's say, Russian culture, Asian culture. It's a very playful watch. Most collectors that I meet that like I don't know yet, this is the watch they want to see. Yeah. Because it's you can't see it, uh, you know, often. For, and, and for like mainstream people, they don't know what the hell you're wearing. Yeah. And when and when I remember when you got this, I mean, obviously, check-in wasn't who he is today yeah. and this this watch wasn't as uh, impactful yes. uh, as, as it is today. Uh, so you were, I think you were the first, if not one of the first people that I had met that had one of these. Yeah, possibly. And, and of course, you know, for me, it freaks me out because I don't like <laughs> clowns. So it, it uh, you know, it, it never, <laughs> it never does it for me. But, uh, but I fully appreciate yeah. uh, the design and, and, and the meaning. I mean, it's really well made, huh? Yeah. Gyoshe dial, yeah. the moon phase at six o'clock pusher here on the, on the second, second crown, 
hand painted stuff, you know, everything made in his watch. Absolutely. Shop. And Shaiken so, is an incredible watchmaker. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, this is the watch that kind of put him on the map. Yeah. But yeah. you're talking about some unbelievable watchmaking before yes. that. You know, the cinema watch yeah. is the one of the most, does. That, the, uh, as well. And, you know, both of them are some of the, it's some of the most creative watchmaking that I have ever seen. Sure. Uh, and it, and for those of you that don't know about the academy, you know the academy is, you know, which was founded by uh, founded by Sven Anderson yeah. and um, Vincent Calabrese. Vincent Calabrese, that's right. Uh, Sven Anderson and Vincent Calabrese back in what was it the the eighties, I think it yeah, was. Probably, yeah. And uh, we did a really interesting article about you know about the the uh, the foundational uh, period of of the academy on our on our on our website. So if you guys are interested, you know you could. Uh, you could check it out, um, but it's it's an environment and a place that brought in so many incredible watchmakers over the last yes. few decades. I mean, you're talking people like uh, I believe uh, Daniels and Dufour and Jorn, everybody, uh, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Oh, yeah. and uh, and Felix Baumgartner from Urwerk and Andreas Strehler yes. and you know I mean Sven, Sven Anderson and Vincent Calabrese alone um, are, are incredible yeah. uh, and have done some some terrific work for brands uh, as well. So you know guys like Chaikin who who's uh, the president now? Uh, Chaikin is. I did not know that. That's yeah. wow. And he's got over ninety patents. It's pretty incredible. Probably more than anybody of the other watchmakers. Yeah. Wow. And he's like a self-made guy in a way. Like if he doesn't have a tool, he builds it. Yeah. Nowadays you can afford probably everything because it's really successful with the Joker line. But uh, back in the day, if you see his workshop, it's really like, you know, yeah. he puts it all together. And all, this year, I think the Academy is, is having their own little event during Watches and Wonders in Geneva. Yeah. Uh, they, they got together and um, got a, a, a really outstanding space mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be in Geneva taking place the same time as Watchers and Wonders. Yeah, and so great. if if people are, are in town and, you know, are looking to see some really beautiful, intricate uh, work and meet meet these amazing watchmakers behind uh, behind these brands, I think it's worth a stop. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. So we go from a, uh, I guess we, we go from small brands to <laughs> hopping over into to, the, to the, the big boy, big brand territory. This is the social media's favorite watch brand, <laughs> Pivlo, with the unaligned screws, because it's screws, okay? <laughs> the topic we always have, I even made a video especially about the bezel screws of the AP and the Hublot yeah. to explain to people, yeah. because most were oblivious. Most people think the AP screws are screwed in. Actually screwed. It's, it's not. not. No. You can't screw that. No. It's, but on the bottom, you have the screws which are uneven. But this is a very controversial brand for most people online. Even for you, uh, I mean, he told me privately it's his favorite watch on the table. <laughs> um, but this again has meaning to me, you know. I'm, I'm part of the Singapore Watch Club. Um, Tom is a great friend of mine. Oh, every time I visit Singapore, it's I, I love going there, partying. The food is great. The environment is nice. Watch collecting in Singapore is amazing. A lot of special pieces are in Asia, especially in the independence. Yeah. Um, so as they did the second edition of the Singapore Watch Club, the first was a Ulysse Narda. Um, he asked me if I would you know like to participate in in this, and I always wanted the Hublot. Um, I like a few other models, but this was the perfect one. So he showed us the rendering of the, or the rough idea of the model and I immediately committed. I even chose my number. Um, and then basically we waited for the watch, I think one and a half years probably. They really had difficulties with creating the, the, the dial because it's a real linen it's dial. It's a linen dial. First time for Hublot and then yeah. they put like a resin above it um, to protect the you know, sure. texture. Yeah. Um, first time they did uh, applied Chinese numerals at Hublot, plus Fumé dial, obviously. And first time they made a classic fusion with the rose gold uh, details. So a lot of firsts on this watch, plus the logo of Hublot is on the crystal. It's definitely a watch that um, super that, that's well. attractive. I think the design was, you know, it's really meaningful and yeah. Uh, it is a wearable watch, yeah. It is. And look. It doesn't scratch, a ceramic case. It, look, what I always discuss with, with my clients, with my friends, you know, in the industry, right? For, for me personally, it's about what's your philosophy as a brand, yeah. right? Like, 
you know, is your philosophy X and are you sticking to it? Right. Or is your yeah. philosophy Y and are you sticking to it? And everybody has their own thing. You know, yeah. it just happens that with, with what I do, you know, at Esperlux and at Tempest, it's, you know, we focus on the boutique and the independent. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, whereas and, and I think there's plenty to go around for everybody. Right. It just depends on what you like. Yeah. And so it doesn't mean it's good or bad. No. Um, I think there's it's just a matter of preference and taste. Yes, for sure. And again, when I have this, I'm in the mindset of I'm in hot, like uh, humid Singapore. You know, drinking sugar cane, eating uh, you know satay, stingray. It's a memento. It's, it's right. a it's memento. Ex it's experiential. Yeah. Also, it takes me immediately yeah. to traveling. You know, seeing friends. Yeah. Again, we talk about meaning, right? Yeah. That's like the Ming watch, basically. Yeah. I connect this with you. And this I connect with Tom. Yeah. So okay, so we'll go. We'll go again. Big brand. Yes. And then we'll go small brand. Yeah. Let's talk about the OP. This is probably one of the most. Uh, Hyped <laughs> watches, right? Hyped up watches over the last uh, yeah. couple of years. It's weird, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't 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 be wearing that in public. I guess nowadays, I don't know. In Zurich is okay. Yeah, yeah. On yeah, the Bahnhofstrasse, yeah. we're safe there. Um, but yeah, if you go travel with this watch, I mean, I wouldn't go. Yeah. This watch doesn't leave the country probably. Um, it never will, unless somebody really wants to see it. But also, it's not fun because when I travel and I go to events or watch fairs. I try to bring stuff that people don't see. You yeah. can go to your Rolex boutique and see this watch, possibly, if you, if they have it on stock. Um, but this I bought pretty much, I saw the OP, I didn't have a Rolex in my collection. I like the colorful dials. I went to check them out. I checked out the Tiffany dial, the the red, the green, and this one was my favorite one. It's my favorite too. Yeah. I. I I don't know why. I, I like this. It's like a mustard yellow. You yeah, want to call it that? It's nice in a way, yeah. you know. I sometimes put it on a strap, which people hate me for because, you know, Rolex collectors are very, you know, we, we like the bracelet, keep it on the bracelet. Yeah, no, yeah. it should stay on the bracelet. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's my watch. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this was a fun pickup. You know, I, I ordered it at, uh, at, um, at the store, which I won't mention because everybody wants to find out where you, where you buy watches. <laughs> it's not a secret, guys. So you got to be a good client of a store and they take care of you. Simple as that. Mm. You try to buy as diverse as possible. So you're, you know, even better client and that's it. I got this. I think the price is 5,300 Swiss francs last year. Nowadays it's up 5%. But market value at the moment is at fifteen thousand Swiss francs. I mean, it's yeah, it's ridiculous. I don't, I don't think it's worth more than the retail price yeah. for me. Maybe six k, okay, but I wouldn't go that far. Um, and it's nice to have, I think, as a collection. Like I have a bigger collection as well. We just chose a few pieces here today, but it's nice to have balance in the collection because in the past, you know, when we when we we met like five years ago independents weren't this hot. Yes. You know? Yeah. So if you buy a Chaikin five years ago or a Debitune or whatever, you weren't sure if the price is gonna go up or if it's gonna go down. Yeah. But like today, it's definitely a little bit I mean look, it's it was riskier. It, it was riskier. Way riskier, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's good to have a balance in the collection with Absolutely. some mainstream pieces. Let's say if you lose something on independent, which nowadays doesn't happen anymore, right? Independents nowadays are also super hot. It's good to have balance, that's it. And I just like it. And to be honest, on the wrist, it's super wearable. Yeah. It's super nice to it wear. Is. Bracelet's it is. cool. It's just a great all around watch. Yeah. Rolex makes great watches. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Simple as that. Yeah. Everybody knows it. So I'm, I'm trying to buy, like, at the moment, like one Rolex per year if it's possible. Um, not your common pieces like the Daytona and GMT, but more like quirky stuff, you know? Yeah. I like the Explorer 2 with the white dial, you know? Not the black, the white. Sure. Um, so I might get this this year, fingers crossed. Although now even the quirky stuff is going for... Now everything is quirky. I mean, it's, yeah. it's just the dynamics of the market today. Yeah, it right? trickles down, right? Yeah. You wanted this, you can't get it. And then just go down the list. What's closest? to my, uh, you know, yeah. this desired watch. But it's a, it's a nice mix, you know. I, you know, I always laugh when uh, I see my collection, even myself, I think this makes no sense, right? <laughs> yeah, there's no rhyme or rhythm to it. You have no, uh, yeah. no style, you just buy what you like. Uh, very diverse, usually. Sometimes I make fun, like I, I am my own watch collector meetup, you know, because it's so weird and diverse. So 
when you collect, when you look to purchase a new piece, do you have any themes in mind? You know, like when I when I purchase, you know, when I look for the next thing, right? It's usually part of something that I'm thinking about, mm -hmm. right? A theme or something along those lines. You know, I look at each brand on its own and I say, you know, what is what is this what is this brand really good at? Mm -hmm. And that's what I try to um, that's what I try to uh, focus on when yeah. I'm purchasing the, my next piece. Do you do that, or it's just you buy what you love? It's really random sometimes because yeah. I also buy, like as you see here on the table, like clocks and weird creations. Yeah. So these just pop up randomly yeah. when I'm on the online pages. You know, I just see this, and I need to have it. You know. By the way, this is like there's <laughs> only just a few of what he's got. Yes. And also, I have a lot of yeah. pocket watches. Yeah, that's which right. Which again makes no sense to have nowadays, but uh, I just buy what I like. That's the that's the the key point of of, of everything basically. Of course, sometimes I buy a watch like the Cartiers that I have because it was a good opportunity. But again, the Hublot, the Joker, the Ming, the, the Omega, there was all watches I liked, you know. With the Omega, granted, let's say I was looking at my budget. So I said, okay, I have 200 bucks. What can I get? Yes. Either a quartz modern watch or a vintage Omega. So I went for the Omega. Now this is worth 700 maybe or a thousand even. I don't know. Maybe it went up 10 years ago. You know? There's no like rhyme and reason, like you said, but slowly I, I'm seeing a change in my style. I want to probably slim down the collection because if you saw my, my, my whole video, it became a bit out of hand, I yeah. think as well. Um, nice pieces, yeah. but like there's no like, you know, style. So I want to slim down and focus on like big pieces. I want a DB28, DB tune, mm -hmm. you know. I want to buy a nice Urwerk, you know. But in order for me to do that, I have to let go of a few pieces and just allocate the money towards that. So I think in the future, I'm going to keep five of the watches I have, sell maybe the rest, and then just uh, buy like really specific stuff. I like the Opus watches. I like the MVNF, you know. I like a Crivia one day if it's possible. Maybe Angelus, you know, the Turbions. I always, you know, talk to you about the Angelus U40 or the... the, the it's cool watches, yeah. but uh, something has to go in order for me to basically make that purchase. I think that's the direction I'm going to go in the future. But you know, when a buddy says, I saw this, it's a nice price, you're like, ah, just take All right, money. fine. Take my money. Let's go. <laughs> take my money. We'll change next year. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I know I know the feeling. I just got sold a pen recently. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Samuel Naldi. But it's nice to discover new watchmakers. So yes. this is maybe a good segue to my latest purchase. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so this was made by Felipe Pikulik, a young and up and coming, I would say, watchmaker from Berlin, Germany. He was born in 94, so he's uh, slightly younger than I am and a bit younger than you are. Uh, and when watchmakers start to get younger than me, that's when I know I'm starting to <laughs> like, you know, he used to be, I was the young, I was the young buck, you know, when I started yes, out and yes. then now it's okay. Now we're seeing these young guys, young kids come up, you yeah. know, they're making some really cool stuff. So like, like Felipe. Yeah. So f I met Felipe, I would say last year, July, June, I don't know, something like this. That's the first time I saw the watch. Um, I started talking to him and we basically decided to start this project in September. I had an idea of what I want. I really love the uh, frosted finish of uh, Roman Gautier watches mm -hmm. with, the, with, with the beveling. Yes. So this is what we are going for here, obviously. I wanted to keep the movement as clean as possible uh, with nice onglage. Um, so basically, Felipe has uh, a base model called the Sternhimmel. They start at 2.8 thousand euros. Only this movement, hand finished, and the custom made dial and hands. And he makes the diamond setting on the um, dial himself, actually. And the, uh, you have VVS stones on the dial. So the highest quality, basically. Then we went for a custom engraved dial in the middle mm -hmm. with a nice, like, uh, you know, round, uh, like, um, design. I don't know how to call it. It looks like... Um, like a shield somehow, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it does. Um, never done before by him. So this was hand engraved in Germany. And he said, let's do something with your logo. And I'm always opposed to this idea when the watchmakers say this yeah. to me, because I don't want my logo to be, you know, in the center of it, or maybe mess with the design of the of the watch. But I really like this when he showed it to me. He made like a sketch and in person, I really love it. So the second disc is basically my logo. And we've got diamonds, obviously, on the lugs as well. I like diamonds on watches, but um, I'm waiting, you know, for the right time to buy it. 
And this was like still like a bit of a classy touch to it, I think. Brushed case, again, engraved balance cock as well. I mean, this is a watch also many people want to see in Zurich that I talked to because it's just so rare to come, you know, come about. And Felipe used to work at Kudoke, used to work at the uh, Lord Flang. Then uh, Lang and Zene wanted him. And I think at that time he already started to become independent. So he just, you know, took a leap of faith and... So it's really interesting, you know, we're starting to see some of these uh, young watchmakers do their own thing. Um, I don't think that could have happened in any other time. I mean, they have so many tools at their disposal today and there's so much, there's so much connectivity out there. Yeah. And you know, exposure when you talk clients. about, yeah, when you talk about social media, you talk about Instagram, you talk about YouTube. I've been saying this recently that I think all these guys have it easy because yeah, they for sure. you know they haven't experienced the um the struggle to get there yeah perhaps they have in their own ways but not in the way that the independent guys, one, the academy guys yeah. that that have really paved the way and pioneered it for you know for them to for be sure. able to do what they're doing today right but on the flip side it's so encouraging to see young watchmakers yeah. doing their thing it, it gives you hope that mm. hey this is going to keep going right the next generation's coming along yeah. you know i think people were very scared mm. that when the, you know when the apple watch came out they said you know our generation yeah. was going to like go away from watchmaking for traditional watchmaking and we're just going to go digital and that's yeah. it and i see it all the time my my core collector clients are in their uh, in their you know I think thirties thirties yeah. forties uh, you know that's that's like my target that's it's my very target young huh? yeah for the watches yourself that's my yeah it's my core it's my core collector uh, a client group and and it's uh, it's hopeful and so we'll yeah. see if that's going to trickle down to the next generation in the twenties mm -hmm. right um, and if they're gonna carry on yeah. um, and you know and and, and so. finding meaning in traditional watchmaking. But with watches like Felipe's, let's say they can because the price point is very affordable. So they start at 2.8K, it depends what you want. This watch is uh, approximately 7,000 euros, but still with a lot of work and hand finishing into it, you know? And I think with somebody like him, it's always interesting, you know, to think about what is he gonna bring out in two years? Cause you know, this is the foundation of yeah. getting money, buying yeah. machines, sure. getting people knowledge. But down the line, I think, we have something cool coming up. I hope, I mean, I'm, I speak to Felipe a lot, so uh, I can't wait to see what's gonna you know, bring out in the future. Well, this was great. Thank uh, you for coming, uh, for visiting me. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for being, uh, thanks for, I'm returning the favor now. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks for being the first guest on our video, our collector video series. Thank you for being my first. Oh yeah, it's, <laughs> it's getting weird. So thanks for joining us. Much appreciated. Stay tuned for our next video. Bye.